Standards of better or worse are not illusory or unnecessary. If you hadn't decided that what you are doing right now was better than the alternatives, you wouldn't be doing it. The idea of a value free choice is a contradiction in terms. Value judgments are a precondition for action. Furthermore, every activity once chosen comes with its own internal standards of accomplishment. If something can be done at all, it can be done better or worse. To do anything at all is therefore to play a game with a defined and valued end, which can always be reached more or less efficiently and elegantly. Every game comes with its chance of success or failure. Differentials in quality are omnipresent. Furthermore, if there was no better and worse, nothing would be worth doing. There would be no value and therefore no meaning. Why make an effort if it doesn't improve anything? Meaning itself requires the difference between better and worse. How then can the voice of critical self consciousness be stilled? Where are the flaws in the apparently impeccable logic of its message? We might start by considering the all too black and white words themselves success or failure. You are either a success, a comprehensive, singular, over, all good thing, or its opposite, a failure over, all good thing, or its opposite, a failure, a comprehensive, singular. The words imply no alternative and no middle ground. However, in a world as complex as ours, such generalizations, Morelli, such failure to differentiate, are a sign of naive, unsophisticated, or even malevolent analysis. There are vital degrees and gradations of value obliterated by this binary system, and the consequences are not good. To begin with, there is not just one game at which to succeed or fail. There are many games, and more specifically, many good games, games that match your talents, involve you productively with other people, and sustain and even improve themselves across time. Lawyer is a good game. So is plumber, physician, carpenter, or school teacher. The world allows for many ways of being. If you don't succeed at one, you can try another. You can pick something better matched to your unique mix of strengths, weaknesses, and situation. Furthermore, if changing games does not work, you can invent a new one. I recently watched a talent show featuring a mime who taped his mouth shut and did something ridiculous with oven mitts. That was unexpected. That was original. It seemed to be working for him. It's also unlikely that you're playing only one game. You have a career and friends and family members and personal projects and artistic endeavors and athletic pursuits. You might consider judging your success across all the games you play. Imagine that you are very good at some, middling at others, and terrible at the remainder. Perhaps that's how it should be. You might object. I should be winning at everything, but winning at everything might only mean that you're not doing anything new or difficult. You might be winning, but you're not growing, and growing might be the most important form of winning. Should victory in the present always take precedence over trajectory across time? Finally, you might come to realize that the specifics of the many games you are playing are so unique to you, so individual, that comparison to others is simply inappropriate. Perhaps you are overvaluing what you don't have and undervaluing what you do. There's some real utility in gratitude. It's also good protection against the dangers of victimhood and resentment. Your colleague outperforms you at work. His wife, however, is having an affair while your marriage is stable and happy. Who has it better? The celebrity you admire is a chronic drunk driver and bigot. Is his life truly preferable to yours? When the internal critic puts you down using such comparisons, here's how it operates. First, it selects a single arbitrary domain of comparison, fame, maybe, or power. Then it acts as if that domain is the only one that is relevant. 
Then it contrasts you unfavorably with someone truly stellar within that domain. It can take that final step even further, using the unbridgeable gap between you and its target of comparison as evidence for the fundamental injustice of life. That way, your motivation to do anything at all can be most effectively undermined. Those who accept such an approach to self-evaluation certainly can't be accused of making things too easy for themselves. But it's just as big a problem to make things too difficult. You take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet, because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider, but there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. When we are very young, we are neither individual nor informed. We have not had the time nor gained the wisdom to develop our own standards. In consequence, we must compare ourselves to others because standards are necessary. Without them, there is nowhere to go and nothing to do. As we mature, we become, by contrast, increasingly individual and unique. The conditions of our lives become more and more personal and less and less comparable with those of others. Symbolically speaking, this means we must leave the house ruled by our father and confront the chaos of our individual being. We must take note of our disarray without completely abandoning that father in the process. We must then rediscover the values of our culture, veiled from us by our ignorance, hidden in the dusty treasure trove of the past. Rescue them and integrate them into our own lives. This is what gives existence its full and necessary meaning. Who are you? You think you know, but maybe you don't. You are, for example, neither your own master nor your own slave. You cannot easily tell yourself what to do and compel your own obedience any more than you can easily tell your own obedience, any more than you can easily tell your husband, wife, son, or daughter what to do and compel theirs. You are interested in some things and not in others. You can shape that interest, but there are limits. Some activities will always engage you and others simply will not. You have a nature. You can play the tyrant to it, but you will certainly rebel. How hard can you force yourself to work and sustain your desire to work? How much can you sacrifice to your partner before generosity turns to resentment? What is it that you actually love? What is it that you genuinely want before you can articulate your own standards of value. You must see yourself as a stranger, and then you must get to know yourself. What do you find valuable or pleasurable? How much leisure, enjoyment, and reward do you require so that you feel like more than a beast of burden? How must you treat yourself so you won't kick over the traces and smash up your corral? You could force yourself through your daily grind and kick your dog in frustration when you come home. You could watch the precious days tick by, or you could learn how to entice yourself into sustainable, productive activity. Do you ask yourself what you want? Do you negotiate fairly with yourself? Or are you a tyrant with yourself as slave? When do you dislike your parents, 
your spouse or your children and why? What might be done about that? What do you need and want from your friends and your business partners? This is not a mere matter of what you should want. I'm not talking about what other people require from you or your duties to them. I'm talking about determining the nature of your moral obligation to yourself. Should might enter into it because you are nested within a network of social obligations. Should is your responsibility and you should live up to it. But this does not mean you must take the role of lapdog, obedient and harmless. That's how a dictator wants his slaves. Dare instead to be dangerous. Dare to be truthful. Dare to articulate yourself and express or at least become aware of what would really justify your life. Plan a life you'd like to have. And and you do that partly by referring to social norms. That's more or less rescuing your father from the belly of the whale. But the way, other way you do that is by having a little conversation with yourself about as, as if you don't really know who you are because you know what you're like. You won't do what you're told. You won't do what you tell yourself to do. You must have noticed that. It's like you're a bad employee and a worse boss. And, and both of those work you know, for you. You don't know what you want to do. And then when you tell yourself what to do, you don't do it anyway. So you should fire yourself and find someone else to be. But, but you know, my point is, is that you have to understand that you're not your own servant, so to speak. You're someone that you have to negotiate with. And that's, and you, you're someone that you want to present the opportunity of having a good life to. And that's hard for people because they don't like themselves very much. So, you know, they're always like cracking the whip and then procrastinating and cracking the whip and then procrastinating. And it's like, God, it's so boring and it's such a pathetic way of spending your time. How do you need to be spoken to? What do you need to take from people? What are you putting up with or pretending to like from duty or obligation? Consult your resentment. It's a revelatory emotion for all its pathology. It's part of an evil triad arrogance, deceit, and resentment. Nothing causes more harm than this underworld trinity. But resentment always means one of two things. Either the resentful person is immature, in which case he or she should shut up, quit whining, and get on with it, or there is tyranny afoot, in which case the person subjugated has a moral obligation to speak up. Why? Because the consequence of remaining silent is worse. Of course, it's easier in the moment to stay silent and avoid conflict. But in the long term, that's deadly. When you have something to say, silence is a lie. And tyranny feeds on lies. When should you push back against oppression despite the danger? When you start nursing secret fantasies of revenge. When your life is being poisoned and your imagination fills with the wish to devour and destroy. I had a client decades ago who suffered from severe obsessive compulsive disorder. He had to line up his pajamas just right before he could go to sleep at night. Then he had to fluff his pillow. Then he had to adjust the bed sheets over and over and over and over and over. I said, maybe that part of you that insanely persistent part wants something, inarticulate though it may be. Let it have its say. What could it be? He said, control. I said, close your eyes and let it tell you what it wants. Don't let fear stop you. You don't have to act it out just because you're thinking it. He said, it wants me to take my stepfather by the collar, put him up against the door and shake him like a rat. Maybe it was time to shake someone like a rat, although I suggested something a bit less primal. But God only knows what battles must be fought, forthrightly, voluntarily, on the road to peace. What do you do to avoid conflict, necessary though it may be? What are you inclined to lie about, assuming that the truth might be intolerable? What do you fake? The infant is dependent on his parents for almost everything he needs. The child, the successful child, can leave his parents at least temporarily and make friends. He gives up a little of himself to do that, but gains much in return. 
The successful adolescent must take that process to its logical conclusion. He has to leave his parents and become like everyone else. He has to integrate with the group so he can transcend his childhood dependency. Once integrated, the successful adult then must learn how to be just the right amount different from everyone else. Be cautious when you're comparing yourself to others. You're a singular being once you're an adult. You have your own particular, specific problems, financial, intimate, psychological, and otherwise. Those are embedded in the unique, broader context of your existence. Your career or job works for you in a personal manner, or it does not. And it does so in a unique interplay with the other specifics of your life. You must decide how much of your time to spend on this, and how much on that. You must decide what to let go and what to pursue.